Large language model agents will supercharge your automation and data analytics, and every product manager and analytics leader needs to know about them. By the end of this video, you'll understand what agents can do and how to begin deploying them at your company. Welcome to episode four in ProLego's AI strategy series. In episode three, I covered Unified Natural Language Query, the killer app for enterprise AI. I demonstrated Unified NLQ against a single data table and explained why it is undeniably the future of business intelligence. Well, today we're gonna continue our Unified NLQ journey by introducing multiple tables. Solving this critical challenge requires the use of large language model agents. So let's get started by talking about them. If you find the term software agent confusing, you're in good company. Most of the definitions are too abstract and the terms mean different things in different situations. So let's come up with a simpler definition that suits our purposes. A large language model agent is a software entity capable of reasoning and autonomously executing tasks. We're gonna spend a lot of time digging into agents in future episodes, but today I'll constrain the discussion to querying databases. But before we go any further, let's discuss why getting data out of a database is such a difficult problem. Relational databases were designed to overcome the challenges of maintaining data consistency and integrity. Unfortunately, this design isn't naturally aligned with how most people think and communicate. In fact, every developer knows the challenge of creating communication interfaces between software and databases. So getting data out of multiple tables in a database is a difficult task, even for people, but agents can do it as you're about to see. Here is another demo of Unified NLQ. First, let's take a look at the data we're gonna be using in this episode. There are eight tables representing information in a bank's CRM system, such as customers, credit scores, and accounts. Once again, we want to empower users to begin getting answers about this data by asking simple questions. But this is significantly harder than getting data from one table as I demonstrated in episode three. Asking questions across many tables requires an agent to come up with a plan. Here is how the demo works. The user asks a question using natural language like, how many products does the person who most recently opened a mortgage have? The answer will appear at the bottom and in the middle is a status window telling the user what is happening. And it worked. Let's take a look at the message log below to see what happened. The chatbot message log shows the dialogue between this application, which is the orangish color, and the agent, which is OpenAI's GPT-4 model in gray. The workflow begins with the agent evaluating the feasibility of answering the question. In this case, it found the question to be reasonable and the process continues. So you're probably wondering, what is an unreasonable question? Well, an example would be asking how to insert Charlie into the database. Not surprisingly, the agent advises that it cannot help me insert Charlie into the database. Thanks for your help, Charlie. Now I realize this is a silly example of an unreasonable question, but as we'll discuss with Justin in a moment, one of the keys to making a functioning NLQ application is creating the interfaces that constrain and guide the users and the agent to the right answers. Evaluating question reasonableness is a simple way to filter out the obviously infeasible questions. Without it, the agent can wander down random directions as can be seen in the creative open source projects like AutoGPT. After evaluating the question for reasonableness, the agent creates a plan for answering the question. The agent needs to find the most recently opened mortgage, get the customer's ID, and then use the ID to count the number of products the customer has. This is an excellent plan that unfortunately just won't work. The mortgage table doesn't have a customer ID field. Who would design a mortgage table without a customer ID? Well, we deliberately made this example more complex for the agent because this is very typical of what happens in the real world. As you know, 
data is messy. Unfortunately, the question cannot be answered without the customer ID. What happens next is truly amazing and it is why Unified NLQ is the killer app for enterprise AI. When our application attempted to run the SQL from the agent, it detected the error and relayed the problem back to the agent. And the agent recovers. It reasons through the problem, noting that it can use the account number from the mortgage table to look up the customer's ID in the products table. So it gets the account number from the most recently opened mortgage. Using that account number, it gets the correct customer ID. And from here, it is home free. Now let's see if we can push the agent a bit harder. I decided to repeat the question and also ask, what is their name and credit score? The agent had no problem extending the search with a few extra queries, so I decided to push it harder still. This time, I also told it to calculate net worth, and it replied with a wealth of helpful information, including what it could do, could not do, and alternative options. For example, it guides me to calculating the balance in multiple accounts. There is a lot going on here, and the transformative impact of this technology may not be obvious to everyone at first glance. So let me do a quick summary of where we've come in the past two episodes. In episode three, I showed how you can create applications that allow your customers to get answers by asking questions using everyday language. I also showed you how the large language models could provide your customers with valuable context about the data. And today I demonstrated how you can deploy the agents to answer questions by systematically gathering data from multiple data sources and recovering from mistakes when they make them. Unified NLQ will be the killer app for enterprise AI because the demand for this capability will drive adoption across your company. I have yet to encounter a single executive at one of ProLego's clients who wasn't looking for this type of insight from their data. And let's be honest, the projects that create instant value for executives are the ones most likely to get funded. But this is a canned demo on a tiny fictitious database. We took a big leap from episode two to episode three, but we have yet to address challenges like multiple databases, document repositories, tools, and APIs. Fortunately, ProLego is already working through these challenges and will cover them in upcoming episodes. I sincerely hope we can continue this exciting journey together and that you'll stay in touch so I can email you when I release new episodes. The link to our newsletter is down in the show notes and you can hit subscribe on YouTube to be alerted as soon as we release a new episode. Let's now jump into the best part of the episode and get some deeper insights from Justin Pounders who led the development of this solution. Hello, Justin. Hi, Gavin. So for the benefit of our audience, could you describe basically how the application works at a high level and especially how the agent works? In short, we want to ask it potentially a multi-part question and have the agent be smart enough to break down that question into multiple parts and run multiple queries and then synthesize an answer. What were some of the key learnings from building the, you know, the agent solution? Yeah, well, I think two things come to mind. First, in this case, we have a database consisting of multiple tables and the tables are connected using, you know, foreign keys, for example. And so one of the things we have to do up, up front is if the agent is going to know how to look at this database and understand the structure and what pieces can be joined to what other pieces, well, we have to tell the agent how that database was constructed. Uh, and so that's the first thing that we need to put into the context, not just here's a bunch of data, but this column and this uh, table can be linked or joined to this column and this table so that the, the agent understands how it can go across, traverse the database structure intelligently. The second big thing, we need to lay out the format for the interaction between us or our software and the LLM agent. So for example, uh, and this is something that was a, it was a big learning in this uh, version of the agent, because we started off by giving it very strict instructions, say, uh, issue a thought and call it a thought and then issue an action, which should be a function call. And then, you know, put your final answer like this. And so we gave it a very uh, uh, specific format for how to talk to us via the API. And it turns out that didn't work very well. Uh, ChatGPT was trained to be a dialogue agent. 
And so we said, well, hey, rather than trying to, you know, tell it specifically how to talk to us, let's just have a conversation and have the right code to understand what to do with those different pieces of the conversation. And turns out that worked a lot better. I guess to your previous comment, metadata about the tables is key to getting the LLM to understand what's happening. So you just, just passing it, you know, you know, column names without other information probably isn't going to work very well. No, and especially not in this case where we have a full database. I think there's eight different tables and certain tables can be joined with other tables on certain fields. So we had to be very explicit in that. And the way we did that was actually introspecting the, in this case, a SQLite database. And we can pull out the SQL creation statements. So the statements that were used to create the tables. And in those statements, we specifically say what's primary key and what's a foreign key and, and how those references and links work. And so even though it's just SQL that we're dumping into the context, the agent, the LLM, ChatGPT in this case, is smart enough to look at those SQL creation statements and understand, okay, I can join this table with this table on these uh, attributes of these column names to pull together the appropriate uh, SQL query and then generate the final response, which is pretty cool to see. Yeah. Wow. God, this, this stuff is amazing. Every time I... <laughs> I, I, I'm running out of hyperboles after a while, but it, it is truly amazing. Um, and that's not obvious, by the way, right? Because we could have just used language to describe the database, but it turns out it's more, I think, specific and concise. I mean, the, uh, the LLM understands SQL, so let's just give it the SQL and let it work with that. It's comp I would have never expected it. I would have expected you have to actually describe each one of the, the columns using natural language. Yeah. So I guess in moving on, in the beginning, you start with a like a filtering up front, which is the reasonableness test. Like, why did you do this and how did you implement it? Yeah. So why we implemented it was the agent that interacts with the database, it's I view it as this narrow tool. So it's a it's an agent that's responsible for given the context of the problem and the description of the database, interacting with the data in that database via SQL. And so it's very sort of constrained. It's it's really good at doing that one thing. But what if I ask it something that's not relevant to the database? So in this case, the database had bank customers and products and accounts and things like that. But if I ask about account opening forms or if I ask about transactions that aren't in the database, well, this agent wants really hard to solve my problem. And so it's gonna start trying to squeeze some information out of the database or making up answers or giving me suggestions you know, which none of those things are necessarily wrong, but it's not going to be able to answer the question. And so we found it's much more efficient to put a screening question up front, say, hey, here's the question. Is this appropriate? Is this a reasonable question given the data that you have access to and the context that you're aware of? And it turns out if you ask the agent, you know, how do I make a ham sandwich? They'll come back immediately and say, this is not a reasonable question. I can't answer it. So we can stop that line of calls and that line of reasoning right there. Or if you ask it how to put a dog inside a database, it doesn't really <laughs> take that as a very reasonable question either. Let's just say a client comes along and wants to start a project where they can begin implementing this type of solution in their environment. How would you start thinking about like defining the problem, constraining it, and breaking it down into something that you can start executing on and systematically isolating risk? I would start small in the sense that don't throw it at a whole data lake with a bunch of document <laughs> stores and databases of different kinds of structure. Maybe so pick just one GPT, database. GPT-4 to data swamp, that's not a, not a good place to start. I wouldn't start there, no. <laughs> uh, maybe just one database. And maybe this is a, a valuable data pay, database because people interact with it frequently. Maybe there's a lot of value. But it's one system. So you could describe that one schema and then just implement uh, this type of agent-based question answering over that single system, over that single database. Then you can you know, figure out what prompting techniques work. Uh, you can add guardrails or sort of constraints like the check for reasonableness, these little knobs and dials, you can kind of get that all figured out for this constrained problem. And then along the way, as you see people interact with the database using this agent, you could look for patterns. So most people are asking these sorts of questions versus those sorts of questions. And so you could further tweak and refine your prompt. Awesome. All right. And final question is, what are you and the team working on now? What can we expect to see in upcoming episodes? What we're really thinking a lot about right now is moving away, adding complexity. So we started with one table, then we went to one database. 
okay, well, what if we now have two, three, four, five databases and we want an agent to be able to pull information and reason over these multiple disparate data sources? Well, how do we do that? And some of the ideas we're throwing around now is rather than having a single agent try to understand what's in all these different data sources and handle all of the coordination between these data calls, it's probably not going to work well. You're going to end up with a ton of information in your context. So rather than taking that kind of one agent to do everything, I think we're going to have more success with having an agent that's responsible for planning, and then that agent can spin off different workers. So worker one goes to this database, worker two goes to this database, and then we pull together the results from these sort of independent workers to keep scope and context limited. This was fantastic information. Thank you so much for sharing and uh, can't wait to see what comes next. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. Well, that's a wrap on episode four. If you're interested in developing a unified NLQ capability at your company, and of course you are, then why not hire ProLego to help accelerate your projects and turn your people into AI experts? Hey, Russ. How can someone learn about ProLego services? Just shoot me an email at russ at prolego.com. So what are you waiting for? Have a great day.